um, this is the book of Samuel, part 31. And we'll be looking at 1 Samuel chapter 31 from verse 1. Now the Philistines fought against Israel. And the men of Israel fled from before the Philistines and fell down, slain in Mount Gilboa. So the, the Israelites fought with the Philistines. And the Philistines conquered them. They so much destroyed the Israelites that they have to run away from the Philistines. Verse 2. And the Philistines followed hard upon Saul. And when the Israelites discovered that, oh, the Philistines are defeating them, they now ran. So even Saul himself ran back. He was running away. So they ran after Saul. They, they ran after Saul. If others will escape, this Saul must not escape. They ran after him. And also they ran after his sons. And the Philistines slew Jonathan and Abinadab and Malkishua, Saul's son. So the three sons of Saul that followed him to the battle were Jonathan, Abinadab, and Malkishua. And the battle went Saul against Saul, and the archers hit him. And he was Saul wounded of the archers. That means an arrow was shot at him. And he was wounded by you know that arrow, but he had not yet died at that time. He was still carrying the, the wound. Then Saul said unto his armor bearer, Draw thy sword and trust me through the ways, lest this uncircumcised come and trust me through and abuse me. But the armor bearer would not, for he was so afraid. Therefore Saul took his sword and fell upon it. I then Saul knew with the arrow that has entered into him, he knew he was going to die. So he told the Samuel bear, I said, please just kill me. I don't want it to be that it was these Philistines that killed me. But the Ammon bearer was scared. So Saul killed himself. So Saul committed suicide. What did he do? He took a sword and he fell on the sword. In those days, mighty men don't always want to be killed by their enemies because the, the storyline is going to be is going to be uh, it's not going to be interesting. So they preferred to die. You know, they prefer to kill themselves or tell their men to kill them. That's more honorable than to be killed by an enemy. That's why when Saul discovered that his armor bearer was not willing to kill him, he fell on the sword. He, he held the sword and, he, you know, he turned his stomach on him and he killed himself. That to Saul is better than being killed by an enemy. And when his armor bearer saw that Saul was dead, he fell likewise upon his sword and died with him. Can you say that? This armor bearer was very faithful. When he saw that Saul was dead, what did he do? He also fell upon his sword and he died also. Why? <laughs> because if he did not die and he went back to the city, they would still end up killing him. You see, there are some positions in those days that are very delicate. One of them is to be armor bearer of a king. Now, to be the armor bearer of a king, you are not expected to be alive when the king is dead. How will you explain? Are you not the armor bearer? That means before the king dies, you should have died first. So, an armor bearer should not escape while the king is dead. Because they will ask you a lot of questions and they will end up killing you. So, armor bearer is there so that whatever will kill the king, we first kill the armor bearer before getting to the king. So, you are now saying you are an armor bearer, you were not killed, but the king died. How? So that was why the man said, I will never explain. I'm supposed to die first now before. Okay, he killed himself. Are you getting it? So Saul died and, and his three sons and his armor bearer and all his men that same day together. And when the men of Israel were on the other side of the valley and they that were on the other side, Jordan, saw the men of Israel fled, and that Saul and his sons were dead. They forsook the cities and fled, and the Philistines came and dwelt there. Can you see that? When the people saw that Saul had died, they left the city. They left the city for the fear of the Philistines, because if anybody comes to fight them, nobody will defend them. As they left the city, the Philistines came to that space and dominated that, that territory. Verse 8, and it came to pass on the morrow when the Philistines came to strip the slain that, we have, that they found Saul and his three sons falling 
in Mount Gilboa. Now, in those days, when they fight and they defeat their enemies, they will go and come the next day to come and uh, empty the, to come and strip those bodies that they had killed. Now, what do I mean by stripping? Now, stripping involves taking their they are valuables. For instance, some people will die with chain on their necks. Some people will fight with golden rings on their hands, golden cap, their sword, their chariots. Either. So, at the first fight, they, they go with spoil. The first spoil can be the animals. You can go with those ones. But when they come again to the dead bodies, they want to come and strip them. So, the one that has gold chain, gold wristwatch, they'll take it, they'll take their sword. Are you there? Take anything valuable. Maybe somebody came with a golden shoe and now he's dead, so they'll just take it. Are you there? So that's what they do when they come the next day to the battlefield. So the Philistines wanted to come and strip these people. So they now found out why they were stripping. They now find out the body of Saul. That Saul had already died. So Saul was part of the dead body they saw. Let's look at what happened. And they cut off his head and stripped off his armor and sent into the land of the Philistines round about to publish it in the house of their idols and among the people. So when they saw Saul, they were, wow, they cut off his head. So they sent it across the land of the Philistines, even to the house of their idols, and they were rejoicing. David cut off the head of Goliath. The Philistines cut off the head of Saul. Can you see that? Meanwhile, David was in the land of the Philistines, but he was not serving the idols of the Philistines. So be wise. Don't gain admission and go to school and be doing the nonsense they are doing there. You can be in a sinful environment and yet you are a saint. Wisdom is profitable for direction. David was in the land of the Philistines and he was not bowing to their idols. You too, don't bow to pressure. Don't bow to pressure. I see God helping you in the name of Jesus. Okay, so don't forget what I told you concerning stripping. That stripping is not done on the first day. Usually stripping is done on the second day of the battle. After they have defeated them, then they will come to strip them. In that stripping, they can take the armor. Yes, the armor, the shield of the one that has died. They take the shield, the armor, the sword, the golden ring, whatever they have that is valuable. So they will come with something that can move those things. Are you there? Okay, take note of that. Okay. Verse 10. And they put his armor in the house of Asherot, Hashtarot, and they fastened his body to the wall of Bethshan. And when the inhabitant of Gabash Gilead heard of that which the Philistines had done to Saul, all the valiant men arose and went all night and took the body of Saul and the bodies of his sons from the wall of Bashan, and came to Jabesh and burnt them there. And they took their bones and buried them under a tree at Jabesh and fasted seven days. Can you see that? So the people of Jabesh Gilead, they understand what it means to be anointed of God. So when they saw the body of Saul and the body of his son displayed in mockery, they said, no, no, no. They came in the night. They took the body. They burnt it. They took the bones, they buried it. That is an honorable burial. Are you there? So they, they, it was the people of Jabez Gilead that now gave Saul a befitting burial. Are you there? May the Lord help us. May you not end like Saul. Saul started as an ordinary man. From an ordinary man, he became a king. From a king, he died a shameful death. May you not end like Saul once again in the name of Jesus. Um, this is the book of Samuel, part 32. And we are going to be looking at um, 2 Samuel chapter 1 from verse 1. Now it came to pass after the death of Saul, when David was returned from the slaughter of the Amalekites. And David had abode two days in Ziklag. Now Ziklag is that place in the land of the Philistines, where, uh, where king, you know, where the king gave to 
to him to dwell with his people. So there was this particular land, you know, they gave to him. So that place is called Ziklag. Are you there? So Ziklag in the land of the Philistines is that uh, that space that is given to David and his people. Now, verse 2, it came to pass on the third day that, behold, a man came out of the camp from Saul with his clothes rent and head upon his head. And so it was when he came to David that he fell to the earth and did obeisance. Now, this man was a young man. Take note of that. He was a young man. So you can call him a youth. Are you there? So he came to David he tore his clothes on his head. You see sand. That's what it means. When the Bible says, "het" was on his head. Het is used to refer to sand. So this man tore his clothes and also he poured sand on his head. So when he got to where David was, he, he made obeisance to him, meaning he bowed to worship him. Verse 3. And David said unto him, From whence comest thou? And he said unto him, Out of the camp of Israel am I escaped. And David said unto him, How rent, how, how went the matter? I pray thee, tell me. And he answered, That the people have fled from the battle, and many of the people also are falling dead. And Saul and Jonathan, his son, are dead also. Now look at this. When he told David that um, uh, actually he's coming from the camp of the Israelites, of course, David was eager to hear what happened because David knew his, his, um, his friend is there, Jonathan, and also his boss, King Saul, is also there. So he wanted to know what happened. He was eager. So the, 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 the young man started. He said, well, the people fled from the battle. That is true. He said many of the people also were killed. That is true. He said, Saul and Jonathan, his son, died, which is also true. So the first information this man gave were true. Are you there? Let's continue. Verse 5. And David said unto the young man that told him, How knowest thou that Saul and Jonathan, his son, be dead? So David now said, ah, How do you know that Saul is dead? And how do you know that Jonathan is dead? Now, the man now said, Now verse 6 now. And the young man that told him said, As I happened by chance upon, upon Mount Gilboa, behold, Saul leaned upon his spear, and lo, the chariots and the horsemen followed hard after him. So he said he was just on the mountain, the, a mountain called Gilboa, when he was watching everything. And when he looked behind, he saw me, and called unto me, and I answered, and I answered, here am I. Can you see what the man is saying? He said, well, you know, Saul, Saul was actually trying to escape from the enemies because he was wounded. So the, Saul now called me, and I said, yes, sir, here, here am I. Let's, let's continue the story. And he said unto me, who art thou? And I answered him, I am an Amalekite. Verse 9, he said unto me again, stand, I pray thee upon me and slay me for anguish is upon me because my life is yet whole in me so i stood upon him and slew him because i was sure that he could not live after that that he was falling and i took the crown that was upon his head and the bracelet that was on his arm and i have brought them either unto my lord can you see that now this man was an amalekite now he now said that this is part of the things he was telling David. He said, King Saul called me and, and asked me to kill him because he did not want the Philistines to kill him. So I went there, I killed him, just like he said, and now, my Lord, don't worry, I've taken his crown and I've taken his bracelet. I've, I've, I've brought everything to you. Can you see? Why is this man saying this? Why is this young man saying this? He's saying this because he wants to secure favor from David. That is one thing common to young men. The young men want to be celebrated. They want to be celebrity. They want to be a controller of many things, even when they don't have capacity to control them. Either they want to be in charge. Whether through a good means or not, they just want to be on the limelight. And this is what this man is doing. He wants to have his way with David. 
he knew that David will surely become king. So he wants to find favor before him so that when he becomes king, of course, he's going to be one of the top officials. Let's see what happens. Meanwhile, the truth is, Saul will never ask him to do that. If Saul will ask anybody to kill him, it will be an Israelite. Because it is a taboo for a king. Are you there? It's a taboo for a king to be killed by the enemy. So Amalekites, they are also the enemies of Israel. So why will he now call another enemy to come and kill him? It's not possible. Are you there? All right. Verse 11. Now, after this happened, now, verse 11 is David's reaction after the young man had, you know, said everything he wants to say. Then David took hold of his clothes and rent them. And likewise, all the men that were with him. When David heard this, he held his clothes, he tore it. And also the men that were with him too, they pieces their clothes. Now, this thing they were doing is a shine to show that they were angry. It's a sign to show that they, they are they are now in a sad state. When people tore their clothes, when people, you know, you know, rent their clothes, what it means is that they are not in a good mood. They are in a sad state. That's what it means. Verse 12, and they mourned and wept and fasted until they, fast, they fasted until even for Saul and for Jonathan his son and for the people of the Lord and for the house of Israel, because they were falling by the sword. So when David heard this, he went into fasting immediately. And they did not eat until evening. So probably this man came with this news in the morning. So when they heard, when they heard the, news, the news, they fasted till evening before they eat. Why? They were mourning for Saul. They were mourning for Jonathan. They were mourning for the people of God who were killed by the sword. To be killed by the sword is not an honorable death. So that was why David was so burdened and he had to fast. He had to mourn for them. So fasting is also a way of mourning. It's, it's, a way of, uh, it's, it's one of the signs to show that you have repented. You, are you there? It's a sign to, to mourn. One of the ways people mourn in the, in the Bible, you know, in the olden days is by fasting. So David's fasting here. It's not to ask for anything from the Lord. It's, it's to mourn the sufferings of the people. It's to mourn the calamity of the people. Are you there? So in the, you know, in the Old Testament, the, the people fasted for several reasons. One of which is to mourn. Are you there? To mourn. All right. And David said unto the young man that told him, Whence art thou? And he answered, I am the son of a stranger, an Amalekite. Can you see that? So that means all through this fasting, this man was there. Meaning that the man has an agenda. His agenda is to be part of David's army. So that's why I said, I don't worry, David. I brought the source crown for you, and I brought his bracelets for you. So he stood there. You know, he was expecting that David is going to recruit him to be part of his army. So that when David becomes king, he's going to be a captain. So, why these people were fasting? He did not go back. He came with the information and he stayed with them. Now, in the evening, when the fasting had ended, David now looked at him and said, Who are you? He said, Well, I'm the son of a stranger, an Amalekite. And David said unto him, How was thou not afraid to stretch forth thy hand to destroy the Lord's anointed? David said, So you, the son of a stranger, you are not scared to kill an anointed man of God. Saul told you to kill him, and you killed him. Meanwhile, this man was lying. It was, it was not the one that killed Aide. We have, we have done the teaching in the previous series. It was not the one that killed, um, it was not the one that killed them, ki- killed them, killed them, King Saul. Aide? Yes, it was King Saul's armor bearer. Aide? That killed him. Are you get what I'm saying? It was King Saul's armor bearer that killed him, not this man. So he was lying. He felt that if he, you know, if he lied like that, if he comes with this weapon of deception, he felt David will embrace him. 
Are you there? You see, don't be too fast to lie. Don't be too fast. Don't 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 plan to deceive people. Are you there? You don't. He, this man is saying he's talking out of ignorance. He does not even know the relationship between uh, David and Jonathan. So he felt because Saul is David's enemy, so David hates everybody in Saul's family. He did not know that the closest person to David was Jonathan, the son of King Saul. So he did not know the relationship between them. He just came with his with his deceptive uh, notion. Everything that that particular thing he said was a lie. He started by saying the truth, but he ended it with a lie. He said, I am the one that killed Saul. Saul told me to kill him, so I killed him. Meanwhile, that was not true. Are you there? Let's see the end of the let's see the end of the story. And David called one of the young men and said, Go near, fall upon him, fall upon him, and he smote him that he died. Are you there? So what David did was he said, This man, you don't deserve to be alive. You kill an anointed man of God. Hey, you kill that man for me. And immediately he died. Can you see that? See, being deceptive is not profitable. The highest thing you can get there is, um, is death. The Bible says there's a way that seemed good unto a man. The end of that way is destruction. Are you there? The end of that way is destruction. So the man thought that he can, he can deceive David and become part of his people, not knowing that he's about to, to die untimely. Verse 16, And David said unto him, Thy blood be upon thy head. For thy mouth has testified against thee, saying, I have slain the Lord's anointed. Can you see that? And David lamented with this lamentation over Saul and over Jonathan his son. Also he bade them teach the children of Judah the use of the bow. Behold, it is written in the book of Jasha. The beauty of Israel is slain upon thy high places. How are the mighty falling? Can you see that? So, the king, one of the things that the king of a land represents is beauty. So, the beauty of a territory is the king of that territory. So, when King Saul died, the Bible says the beauty of Israel has been slain. So, your leader is your beauty. Are you there? So you must learn to pray for your leader because as you do so, you are preserving your beauty. Your disciple is your beauty. If you pray for them, you preserve your beauty. Are you there? There's a beauty that is personal to you and there's a beauty that is reflected in others on the strength of your submission to them. Please take note of this. Verse 20. Tell it not in God. Publish it not in the street of Ashkelon lest the daughters of the Philistine rejoice, lest the daughters of the un uncircumcised triumph. Can you see that? David said, this news that we have gotten now, don't, don't, don't publicize it. I don't want this, the, the enemy of the Lord to rejoice. Can you see that? David was a man working with the wisdom of God. His heart was not bitter against them. For the fact that Saul was trying to kill him does not mean, you know, you should now become so bitter. Ordinarily, if you hear the news that your friend, you know, your somebody that is pursuing you is dead, you should have start rejoicing. That's what many Christians do today. People are dead; they are rejoicing. I can't forget one experience I had. You know, at about, you know, um, a, a governor, one of the governors of our state died. You know, I don't know, maybe early this year. The, government, the governor of our state died. And then I came to church. I think that was after Bible study. I don't know. After Bible study. It's like I came late. So as I was entering, I saw people outside. What were they doing? They were rejoicing. They were shouting. Why? The governor is dead. In my mind, I felt so bad. These are Christians. Even if the man is a devil, for the fact that somebody is dead, that should not stir up a strange joy within a believer. I you get what I'm saying? Not to talk of someone who is your governor, someone who is your beauty. When you say a governor is dead, what you are saying is the beauty of that land has been taken away. So what is the good news there? 
Are you with me? So Daniel, David was not rejoicing at the death of Saul. No, instead of that, he mourned him. Are you there? He was not saying, Thank God Saul is dead. Anyway, if I want to mourn, I will only mourn for my friend Jonathan. But Saul, the good for him. No, David was not that kind of person. Let's continue. See, there's a heart you need to have for you, for your head to take the crown. There's a heart you need to have for your head to take the crown. Are you there? For your head to wear the crown, your heart must be built for the crown. A heart that is not ready cannot attract the crown. So, we don't look at head to place crown. We look at heart to place crown. So, God is not looking at your head to give you crown. Mm -mm. He's looking at your heart to give you crown. There's a kind of heart that David had that qualified his head for the crown. So, if your heart is right, your head is right. Are you there? If your heart is not right, your head is not right for a crown. Are you there? If your heart is not right, your head does not deserve a crown. Take note of this. Verse 21. Ye mountains of Gilboa, let there be no more dew, neither let there be rain upon you, nor fields of offerings. For there the shield of the mighty is, is very is really cast away, and the shield of Saul, as though he had not been anointed with oil. So David was speaking with, you know, with anger. He was speaking in a sad state. He said, ah! David was killed around mountain Gilboa. He said, this mountain, Kai, he was speaking in, you know, with sorrow. He said, this mountain, Kai, the dew of heaven will not come to you again. Because around, you know, around you, a mighty man of God was killed. He was still mourning so. He was mourning. Verse 22. From the blood of the slain, from the fat of the mighty, the bow of Jonathan turned not back, and the sword of Saul returned not empty. Saul and Jonathan were lovely and pleasant in their lives, and in their death they were not divided. They were swifter than eagles, they were stronger than lions. Can you see that? So David began to speak good of them. Oh my God, David, you know, Saul and Jonathan, they were mighty men. They were wonderful people. Look at the heart of David. A wicked heart would say, thank God. I knew the man would die. <laughs> He's messing with me. He will die on time. I said it. He will die. That's good for him. But look at the heart. Look at the heart that is, that is right. Verse 24, ye daughters of Israel, weep over Saul, who put on, okay, ye daughters of Israel, weep over Saul, who clothed you in scarlet with other delights, who put on, who put on ornament of gold upon your apparel, how are the mighty fallen in the midst of the battle, O Jonathan, thou was slain. In thy high places. Can you see that? David was still mourning. He said, oh, Jonathan, you were slain in your high places. That can mean you were, you were slain, you know, at the peak of your breakthrough. You were about to break through. Now you died. Oh, my God. Why did you die? Are you there? David was saying, oh, the, the inhabitants of Israel mourn for King Saul. Are you there? He was mourning. He was, busy. he was busy. Now, this statement that David was making here was a sorrowful statement. Are you there? Now, let me show you something. Now, um, from verse 17, from verse 17 to verse 27, from verse 17 to verse 27, the heading for it, if you, if you want to give it a heading, the heading for it is the lamentations of David. So verse 17 to verse 27 reflects the lamentations of David. Those were the, the, the sorrowful statements, the sorrowful psalms of David. Are you there? He was saying those things, those things he was saying from verse 17 to, to verse 27 were wet from a sorrowful heart. Verse 26, now David said, I am distressed for thee, my brother Jonathan, very pleasant as thou being unto me, 
Thy love to me was wonderful, passing the love of women. How are the mighty falling, and the weapons of war perished. Can you see that? May you not fall in the name of Jesus. This is the wisdom of God. Don't sell it. Um, this is the book of Samuel, part 33. The book of Samuel, part 33. And we're going to be looking at Second Samuel, chapter 2, from verse 1. And it came to pass, after this, that David inquired of the Lord, saying, Shall I go up into any of the cities of Judah? And the Lord said unto him, Go up. And David said, Whether shall I go up? And he said, And he said, Unto Hebron. Can you see David now? David has the Lord. Lord, can I go to Judah? The Lord said, Go. Then he requested for a more detailed information. Lord, where in Judah? And the Lord said, Go to Hebron. That is uh, the right place and the right spot. Some of us are in the right place, but we are not on the right spot. Going to Judah for David is the right place. But which spot in Judah? The right spot is Abram. So ask yourself, the Lord have led you to go to a particular place, and now you are there. Do you, are you on the right spot? The Lord has led you to Nigeria. Now you are there. Which state has he led you to? Which local government in the state has he led you to? Which street in the state? Which street in the local government? Are you there? The spot is the lowest unit. Is the exact place God wants you to stay. Are you there? So don't just don't stop at a wide information. Mm -mm. Get a more restricted one. God is leading me to Lagos. Fine. We're in Lagos. Don't just stay in the right place. Make sure you are standing and you are building on the right spot. It's very important. We need to learn this from David. So David went up either and his two wives also, Hainoam and Abigail. And his men that were with him did David bring up every man with his household and they dwelt in the city of Hebron. Can you see that? The right spot. Not just the right place. The right place is what? Judah. But the right spot is Hebron. Somebody is getting instruction already. So when David was living, he did not live alone. He left with his people. That's leadership. You carry your people along. Are you there? Carry them along. Give them a place. Verse 3. And his men that were with him, did David bring up? Okay, I've read that. Verse 4. <clears throat> and the men of Judah came, and there they anointed David king over the house of Judah. And they told David, saying, that the men of Jabesh Gilead were they that buried Saul. Can you see that? Because David moved as led by the Spirit, he was anointed in Judah. So David was not, you know, the, 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 the kingship of David did not uh, start automatically. A particular segment, a particular part of Israel, you know, there are 12 tribes of Jude, Israel. So one of the 12 tribes, the tribe of Judah, made David their king. So the, the, the remaining 11 tribes are still there. Are you there? But for Judah, the tribe of Judah was the first tribe to recognize David as a king. So they anointed him as a king. So as at that time, David may not be the king of the entire Israel, but you know that one part of Israel, the tribe of Judah, has recognized David as their king. <clears throat> so... Then after that, the people now told David that, okay, it was the men of Jabez Gilead that buried King Saul. Now let's look at what happened. And David sent messengers unto the men of Jabez Gilead and said unto them, Blessed be ye of the Lord, that ye have shown this kindness unto your Lord, even unto Saul, and have buried him. And now the Lord show kindness and truth unto you, and I will requite you this kindness, because ye have done this thing. And therefore now, let your hands be strengthened and be ye valiant, for your master Saul is dead, and also the house of Judah have anointed me king over them. Can you see that? So 
David sent message to the people of Jabez Gilead, encouraging them and thanking them for bearing Saul. Verse 8. But Abner, the son of Nair, captain of Saul's host, took Ishbosheth, the son of Saul, and brought him over to Mehaniam, and made him king over Gilead, and over the Asherites, and over Jezreel, and over Ephraim, and over Benjamin, and over all Israel. Can you see that? So at this point, Israel was divided. David was king over Judah, while that son, that um, son of David, you know, that son of Saul was king over the remaining, you know, over most of the, the parts. Are you there? Basically, over the remaining parts. But David was only king over Israel. Are you getting what I'm saying now? So is the land of Israel at that time was not united because they did not have one king. So David had only a portion. Why that son of uh, Saul had the remaining eleven portion? Are you getting what I'm saying? So okay, and who did this? It was Abner, the captain of Saul's army, that did this. Maybe he was doing that to show his faithfulness to King Saul. Are you there? So let's continue. So take note, the, the name of that son that was made king over the remaining uh, part of Israel was, um, was um, Ish-bosheth. All right. Verse 10. Ish-bosheth, Saul's son, was 40 years old when he began to reign over Israel. And reigned, and and reigned two years, but the house of Judah followed David. Are you there? So it was only the house of Judah that were responding to David. The remaining eleven were responding to Ishbosheth. And the time that David was king in Hebron, over the house of Judah, was seven years and six months. So David was a king in Hebron for seven years and six months. And Abner, the son of Nea, and the servant of Ishbosheth, the son of Saul, went out from Mahaniam to Gibeon. And Joab, the son of Zeruah, and the servant of David, went out and met together by the pool of Gibeon. And they sat down, the one on the one side of the pool, and the other on the other side of the pool. And Abner said to Joab, let the young men now arise and play before us. And Joab said, Let them arise. And there arose, and there arose and went over by a number of, of twelve of Benjamin, which pertained to Ishbosheth the son of Saul, and twelve of the servant of David. And they, they cut every one his fellow by the head. And thrust his sword in his fellow's side. So they fell down together. Wherefore, that place was called Alkat Zarurim, Alkat Hazurim, which is in Gibeon. And there was a very sore battle that day. And Abner was beaten, and the men of Israel before the servant of David. Can you see that? So there was a time that the servant of David and them. Abner, you know, Abner is working with Ishbosheth, the one ruling over the 11 tribes. Why Joab was working with David, David who was ruling over just a single tribe. There was a time they met, so they now, they, they fought. When they fought, it was the servant of David that won, either Joab. Joab won the battle. Joab won with those people he came with. Are you there? All right. Verse... Okay, verse 18. And there, and there were three sons of Zeruah there. Joab and Abishai and Asahel. And Asahel was as light of foot as a wide roll. And Asahel pursued after Abner. And in going, he turned not to the, to the right and 
nor to the left from following Abner. Then Abner looked behind him and said, As thou as a hell? And he answered, I am. And Abner said unto him, Turn aside to thy right hand or to, or to thy left, and lay thee hold on one of the young men, and take his hammer. But Asahel would not turn aside from following him. Can you see that? Abner was now saying, please, don't, don't follow me. You can kill any of these people. Leave me. Well, Abner said, no, it's you. It's you. Are you there? It's, so, um, it was not even Abner. It was, um, the, it was Asahel. Asahel is also working for David. So, Abner is the one leading the, 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 the army of Ishbosheth, the son of Saul that was ruling the eleventh, you know, the eleventh tribe. So as Azariah was chasing Abner, Abner looked back and saw him and said, Are you Azariah? He said, Yes. He said, Okay, you can chase any of these people. Leave me. But Azariah said, No, it's you. I'm chasing you. It's you. I'm after you. And Abner said <clears throat> again to Azariah, Turn thee aside from following me. Wherefore should I smit thee to the ground? How then should I hold up my face to Joab thy brother? Albeit he refused to turn aside. Wherefore Abner with his with the end of the spear smote him under the fifth rule, that the spear came out behind him, and he fell down there, and died in the same place. And it came to pass that as many as came to the place where Azahel fell, fell down. And it came to pass that as many as came to the place where Azariah fell down and died and died stood still. Can you see that? So you see, Abner and Joab, they were like friends. They are connection. So Joab was the one leading the army of David. Abner was the one leading the army of Ishbosheth. So when the two of them met, since Joab and Abner are friends, so what they did was they did not fight each other. Joab selected 12 from his army. Abner selected 12 from his army. So both of them now sat. Joab sat. Abner sat. They wanted the 12, you know, the two of these two teams to fight and see. Are you there? So when the, the 12 fought, it happens to be that the 12 that Joab, who was working for David, selected was the one that defeated the 12 that <laughs> Abner, who was working for so, um, Saul's son, Ishbosheth, selected. So after that, then they knew that, you know, <laughs> this thing is, is not going to end in their favor. So Abner left with the remaining people. So they were running away. So while they were running, of course, Joab did not chase after them because Joab and Abner seemed to be friends. They seemed to be friends. So, but Azahel, who was part of the uh, soldiers that was led by Joab, continued to chase after Abner. Abner told him to go back. As I said, no. And, you know, Abner is a mighty man of war. So, and Azael is just, a, Azael is just a, a novice. So Abner now said, don't chase after me. You can't defeat me. You can chase after any of these young soldiers you are seeing. As I said, no, it's you, it's you. Then Abner said, if I kill you now, what do you want your brother Joab to say? Azariah did not listen. He was still chasing Abner. So Abner killed him. Are you, you getting what I'm saying? He killed Azahel. All right. Let's continue. Verse 24. Joab also and Abishad pursued after Abner. And the sun went down when they were when they were come to the hill of Amma that lied before Gia by the way of the wilderness of Gibeon. Now at this point, now that Azael is dead, friendship ended. Now Joab now began to run after Abner. Joab and Abishai, they were now pursuing Abner. And the children of Benjamin gathered themselves together after Abner and became one troop and stood on the top of an hill. Then Abner called Joab and said, Shall the sword devour forever? Knowest thou not that 
it will be bitterness in the later end. How long shall it be then? Here, thou bid the people return from following their brethren. And Joab said, As God liveth, unless thou hast spoken, surely then in the morning the people had gone up everyone from following his brother. So Joab blew a trumpet, and all the people stood still and, and pursued after Israel no more. Neither fought they anymore. Can you see that? So Abner now, you know, Abner now spoke to Joab. He said, Why are we chasing ourselves? All of us are, we are all Israelites. Are you there? We are we are all one Israelite. And that of, of course that is true. Abner is leading the, the captain for the remaining eleven tribes. Are you there? And Joab is leading the captain for one tribe, which is the tribe of Judah. So the 12 tribes together is what makes the land of Israel. So Abner is now saying, why must we fight ourselves? Why must we kill ourselves? Are we not brethren? So when he said this, Joab now reasoned with him, and then Joab stopped following him. Are you getting what I'm saying? All right. So it was that statement that Abner made that ended that war. So everybody went to their house, no more fighting. And Abner and his, and his men walked all that night through the plain and passed over Jordan and went through all Bithron. And they came to Mahina. And Joab returned from following Abner. And when he had gathered all the people together, there lacked of David's servants 19 men and Azael, making 20 now. But the servant of David had smitten of Benjamin and of Abner's men, so that three hundred and three score men died. So that means from David's camp, they killed twenty plus Azael. But the men of David killed three hundred and sixty from from the other camp. Are you there? So you can you can compare. You can see the ratio twenty to. 22, you can see the ratio now, that's um, 360 to 20, ratio 360 to 20. So you have 36 to, so that's 18 ratio 1. That's a gap, that's a, you know, that's a, that's a wide gap. That's 18 ratio 1. Verse, verse 32, and they took up Azahel and buried him in the sculpture of his father, which was in Bethlehem. And Joab and his men went all night, and they came to Abram. At break of the day. Can you see that? Now, one thing to learn here is this. Um, understanding can end the battle. That's the truth. They were supposed to be fighting. But Abner spoke and said, We are all one. What are we going to gain if we kill each other? I think the best thing for us to do is to stop this fight. And Joab reasoned with him and the battle ended. No, no use of gun, no use of sword. Either. So there are some battles that we hand in your life if you speak the right word. That's it. There are some battles that we hand in your, in your life if you learn right presentation. There are some battles that we hand in your life if you value relationships. Either. There, there, are some value, there are some battles that we hand in your life if you know how to address people, if you know how to speak to people. Are you get what I'm saying? So this this is something we must learn. If there's nothing to learn here, at least this is one point that you must learn. Are you there? How you speak goes a long way. Certain battles we hand if we speak the right word. Not necessarily fighting. You may not need to use the gun you have. You may not need to use the sword you have. Now, when I say gun and sword, it can be it can be money. Maybe you are going to the court for a particular case, spending money on the court giving money to lawyers, doing all sorts of things, wasting a lot of resources. This, all this money you are spending can be likened to your sword. It can be likened to your gun. But maybe the reason you are using this sword and you are using this gun is because you have not learned the right way to speak. So if you present, if you, if you, if you speak the right word, you will deliver yourself from unnecessary battle. Pray the Lord will help us in Jesus' name. This is the wisdom of God. Don't sell it. 
Okay, this is the book of Samuel, part 34. And we're going to be looking at 2 Samuel chapter 3 from verse 1. Now there was a long war between the house of Saul and the house of David. But, but David waxed stronger and stronger, and the house of Saul waxed weaker and weaker. Look at this. Another word for wax means grows. So the house of David grew stronger and stronger, and the house of Saul grew weaker and weaker. So there was a long war between these two houses, between this, you know, these two families. But the house of David grew stronger and stronger. So there are two directions of growth. Either growth can be upwards and growth can be downwards. Either somebody can grow weaker and weaker. Somebody can grow stronger and stronger. So when you say you are growing, it's good for you to uh, expand it. Let's know the direction of your growth. Are you growing stronger and stronger? Or you are growing weaker and weaker. To grow stronger and stronger means you are moving from strength to strength. To grow weaker and weaker means you are moving from weakness to weakness. Are you getting what I'm saying? Verse 2. And unto David were sons born, born in Hebron. And his first son was Ammon. No, that was from Ainoam. That's one of his wives. The second son David had was Shiliab. That one is from Abigail. The third son David had was Absalom. Are you there? Absalom, the son of Mecca. The son of the son of Maka. Are you there? M A A C A H. The son of Maka, the daughter of Talmai, king of Gashur. Can you see that? So. Absalom is not the son of Abigail. The first son David had came from Ainoam, and his name was Ammon. Amnon, yes. The second son was Shiliab. That one came from Abigail. The third son was um, Absalom. This Absalom, Absalom came from Maka. That's the daughter of um, Talmai, the king of Gashur. The fourth son, the, the fourth son David had was Adonijah. That's the son of Agit. Are you there? That's the mother, Agit. The the fifth, the fifth is um, Shephatia. Shephatia. That's the son of Abital. Are you there? That's the name of the mother now. Are you there? Okay. The sixth is Hitrem. Hitrem. That one is by Igla, David's wife. So Igla is also one of the wives of David. These were born to David in Abram. So six wives, and each of them had a son for David. Are you getting it? Ainoam, Abigail, Maka. Hagit, Habital, and Egla. Now, verse 6. And it came to pass why there was war between the house of Saul and the house of David, that Abner made himself strong for the house of Saul. And Saul had a concubine whose name was Rispa, and the daughter of. Okay. Saul had a concubine whose name was Rispa, the daughter of Haya. And Ishbosheth said to Abner, Wherefore hast thou gone in unto my father's concubine? Then was Abner very wroth for the words of Ishbosheth and said, Am I a dog's head which against Judah do show kindness this day unto the house of Saul thy father? to his brethren and to his friends, and have not delivered thee into the hand of David, that thou chargest me today with a fault concerning this woman. So do, so do God to Abner, and more so, except as the Lord has sworn to David, even so I do to him, to translate the kingdom from the house of Saul, to set up the throne of David over Israel. 
and over Judah, from, from Dan even to Bathsheba. And he could not answer Abner a word again, because he feared him. Are you seeing that? So something happened between Abner and Ishbosheth, who was the king over the eleven tribe. So I, I, you know, Ishbosheth now told him, "Ah, why are you sleeping with my father's concubine?" So this word did not go down well with, um, uh, with Abner, because to Abner it was like, you know, the king was trying to, you know, to disgrace him. So. Abner was like, what do you mean? Am I a dog? How can you expect me to sleep with your father's concubine? What's the meaning of all this? So he got angry and he said, okay, is it my fault that I have protected you? I have not delivered you to, to the hands of David? And that's true. If not for Abner, of course, David would have ruled over the many 11 tribes because Abner was the strongest, the strongest man standing for Saul. And because of Abner, Abner was the one who single-handedly delivered the 11 tribes to Ishbosheth. If Abner was not there, David would just rule 12 because Ishbosheth had no strength. I said, so the major pillar, the person that delivered the 11 tribe to the hands of Ishbosheth was Abner. He was very strong, but it happens to be that Abner was devoted and faithful to Saul. So he transferred this faithfulness to his son, Ishbosheth. But um, unfortunately, I think Ishbosheth was not a very wise man. So the Bible says um, the king could not even answer Abner because he was afraid of Abner. That's to show you how strong Abner was. Verse 12 And Abner sent messengers to David on his behalf, saying, Whose is the, is the land? Saying, saying also, Make thy league with me. And behold, my hand shall be with thee to bring about all Israel unto thee. And he said, Well, I will make a league with thee, but one thing I require of thee, that is, thou shalt not see my face, except thou first bring Michal, Saul's daughter, when thou comest to see my face. And David sent messenger to Ishbosheth, Saul's son, saying, Deliver me my wife, Milka which I exposed to me for an hundred, you know, which, yes, which I exposed to me for, for an hundred first kings of the Philistines. So Abner, I mean, you know, Abner at this point, he is angry. So he now said, okay, he now sent a message to David. He said, okay, David, it's like, it's like I'm ready to work for you. This man is not even grateful. It's like I'm ready to work for you, to deliver to you the whole land of Israel. Are you getting it now? So David now said, okay, I'm agree, you know, David now said, okay, I'm ready to, to work with you too, but um, please make sure you don't see me until you come with Milka, my wife, because I have paid what I need to pay, but King Saul stole my wife from me. Can you see that? Verse 14, and David sent messengers to Ishbosheth, Saul's son, saying, deliver me my wife. So David now sent messengers to Ishbosheth again. That's the king over the 11 tribes. He said, give me my wife because I paid all I needed to pay to have her as a wife. Verse 15, And Ishbosheth sent and took her from my husband, from Pautiel, the son of Laish. And her husband went with her along, weeping behind her to Baurim. Then said Abner unto him, Go, return. And he returned. And Abner had Come, and, and, Abner, and Abner had communication with the elders of Israel, saying, Ye sought for David in times past to be king over you. Now then, do it. For the Lord has spoken of David, saying, By the hand of my servant, David, I will save my people, Israel, out of the hand of the Philistines and out of the hand of all their enemies. Can you see that? Now, they now requested for Milka. This was the wife of David, that Saul married to another man again because David was not at all. So now this man, I guess this man that married Micah was enjoying her. <laughs> so while they were bringing Micah to David, the Bible says the man was following Micah and he was crying. Now for you to see how powerful this man Abner was, Abner told the husband, say, hello, go back. And immediately the Bible said the man left, he went back. <laughs> you get what I'm saying? Abner did not stop there. 
Abner now went to the elders of Israel. He called the entire council of Israel. You know, this council involves the, this council we have representatives from all the 12 tribes. So they gathered and Abner spoke to them and said, now, you are the ones that desire to have David as your king. Now, the Lord has spoken it from his mouth. I think it is time for us to actualize this that God has spoken. You see, for you to ascend the throne, you need men that can trust you. Ministry will not grow if you don't have men that believe in your vision. You need men like Abner. Are you there? Men that one of them represent thousands of men. There are men that one of them means hundred. If you have two of such men, you already have 5,000 people. I tell you the truth in the Holy Ghost. There are people that one is one, but there are some that one represent two million. So if you have 10 of them, you already have 20 million people. There are men like that. May God send men like that to you. May God send men like that to assist you in the name of Jesus. Yes. All right, let's continue. Verse 19. And Abner also spoke in the ears of Benjamin. And Abner went also to speak in the ears of David in Hebron, all that seemed good to Israel, and that seemed good to the whole house of Benjamin. So Abner came to David to Hebron, and twenty men with him. And David made Abner and the men that were with him a feast. Are you seeing that at this point when Abner had ended the meeting with the elders of the twelve tribes of Israel, he now came to David with twenty men. When they came, David entertained them. He made a feast for them. It was a great celebration, a welcoming. Are you there? Because Abner is a very great man. Very great and very strong. Verse 21. And Abner said unto David, I will arise and go, and we gather all Israel unto my Lord the king. Can you see that? Abner was ready to work for him. Can you see that? Abner alone could. <laughs> you, know, you, don't, you don't understand what is happening. It was Habna that single-handedly delivered the whole eleven tribe to Ishbosheth, the, 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 the son of Saul. And because Abna was standing with Ishbosheth, Ishbosheth took eleven, and David could only take one. Even that one that David took, if Ad, if Abna had gotten there before David, Abna would have taken the entire twelve tribes for 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 the son of Saul. But this same Abna now is ready to work with David. May God send men to you. I mean, when I say men, I'm not talking about the one that has uh, six packs. Mm -mm. I'm not talking about male gender. No. When I say men, it can be a woman. Either it can be female and male. Either I'm not talking about, I'm not being gender biased here. When I say men, it can be a male, it can be a female. But what I mean by men is people that have capacity. May God send men to you. In the name of Jesus. May he send men, 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 men to you, men. I, I tell you the truth. David was not that strong. But the reason David did not lose a battle was because he has men. That's it. You don't need to be the strongest. But if God bless you with men, ah, <laughs> your enemy will fear you. And Hamna said unto David, I will arise and go and gather all Israel to my Lord, the king, that they may make a league with him, with thee, and that thou mayest reign over all that thy heart desires. And David sent Abner away, and he went in peace. Can you see that? Why did Abner decide to start working for David? Ishbosheth misbehaved. He said, he said what he should not say. Are you saying that? There are some people that will do what they should not do. For you to see what you should see. It's not a terrible prayer. But God does something like that sometimes. Some people who are supposed to be working for you. Are currently tirelessly working for your enemies. So there is a kind of disagreement God will cause. Between the two of them. That will open their eyes to see that. I'm not even supposed to be working for this person. This is who I'm supposed to be working for. And this is why Abner began to work for David. That, that foolish Statement that I, you know, that Ish, Ish, Ishboshit said made Abner stop working for him. And when Abner stopped working for Ishboshit, everything stopped working for him. Because, as obviously, he's going to lose the, the 11 tribes. That's it. And behold, the servants of David 
and Joab came from pursuing a troop and brought in a great spoil with them. But Abner was not with David in Hebron, for he had sent him away, and he was gone in peace. When Joab and all the host that was with him were come, they told Joab, saying, Abner the son of Nea came to the king, and he had sent him away, and he has gone in peace. And Joab came to, to the king and said, What hast thou done? Behold, Abner came unto thee. Why is it that thou hast sent him away, and he is quite gone? Thou knowest Abner the son of Nea, that he came to deceive thee, and to know why, and to know thy going out and thy coming in, and to know all that thou doest. And when Joab was come out from David, he sent messengers after Abner, which brought him again from the well of Sirah, but David knew not. And when Abner was returned to Abram, Joab took him aside in the gate to speak with him quietly, and smote him there under the fifth rib, and he died for the blood of Azahel, his brother. Can you see that? <laughs> May the Lord have mercy. You see, Joab was another strong man in the camp of in the camp of David. But when Joab came and he discovered that um, Abner was already speaking with David, Ka, to him he felt Abner was just trying to deceive David. And he knew that if he tells David to play along with him, David will not play along. So he said, don't worry. He did this thing without telling David. So he invited Abner, then he called him like he wants to talk to him, and he killed him. The same way he killed Azahel. Joab killed Abner. And he did not even tell David about it. This He did this secretly. <laughs> you get what I'm saying? Now the question is, has Abner done his part? Yes. He had already called the elders of Israel. He had already made them know that David is supposed to rule over them. So he had completed. God ensured that Abner did what he should do for David before he died. And the reason Joab killed Abner was because of um, his disbelief. He did not believe that Abner was actually being real. And of course, Abner was not being deceptive. But Joab did not believe. Are you getting what I'm saying? So if we cannot see what is right, we may stay, you know, in the dark. Are you there? Assuming Joab could be a bit patient, we would have seen that obviously Abner meant good, not evil. But he was not patient, so he killed Abner because he wanted to revenge the death of Azahel. See, this revenge mentality... Eh, this revenge mentality has made a lot of people to lose a lot of valuable things. Joab was one of the craziest servants that David had. Even David was scared of Joab. He, Joab was a very crazy man. Can you see what he's doing now? He did not tell David, though. He just killed Abner secretly. Joab was very crazy. Even the Bible noted it that David was even scared of Joab. The same way <laughs> Ishbosheth was scared of Abner. David was. And the reason David was scared of Joab is because sometimes Joab can be crazy. Look at what he did now. Are you, are, are, are you getting what I'm saying? So, as a leader, there are several people that will come to submit to you. Some of them will be like Joab. Some of them will be like Abner. Are you there? But one thing is because you have been ordained to lead them, the wisdom to direct them will come. And as long as you are, the wisdom is coming, you keep leading them. There will not be any clash. Are you getting what I'm saying? Okay. Verse 28. And afterward, when David heard it, he said, I and my kingdom are guiltless before the Lord forever from the blood of Abner, the son of Nea. Let it rest on the head of Joab and all his father's house. And let there not fail from the house of Joab one that had an issue or that is a leper or that leaneth on a staff or that Falleth on the sword, all that lacked bread. So Joab and Abishai, his brother, slew Abner because he had slain their brother Azahel at Gibeon in the battle. Can you see that? When David heard he was not happy and he placed a curse on Joab, said, In the family of Joab, there will always be a leper. There will always be somebody that is leaping. It made a lot of 
things. He said a lot of negative things to Joab because of his wicked act. Are you get what I'm saying? He also said they will not, they will, they will always be someone that lacks bread, meaning there will be poor people in his lineage. Why? Because David was not happy with what uh, Abner and with what Joab did. Meanwhile, Joab did what he was doing because of this revenge mentality. He wanted to revenge. You kill my brother Hazael, uh, you will die. So, you see, revenge blinds the face of people. No, there's no way you will carry a revenge mentality that you will do the right thing. Even if your helper is helping you, you will still, you will, instead of you to say thank you, you will reply you will reply with a negative thing. That's why many people are not grateful. You help them, they hurt you. You bless them, they curse you. Why? Revenge mentality. Revenge mentality will blind their eyes. They cannot recognize friend and enemy because to them, everybody is an enemy. Please don't have this revenge mentality so that you will not end up killing your Abna. Are you getting what I'm saying? So David was so angry. He said, well, the blood of Abna will rest on who? On Joab and his family forever. Now look at this. Was it the fault of Abner for killing Azahel? No. Abner told Azahel to go back. This thing is in the scripture. He said go back. Azahel was very stubborn. You are a young boy, but yet you want to kill a mighty man. Is it possible? So when, it was when Abner saw that he will not listen. That was when he just he threw despair. And despair killed him. He was not willing to kill Azahel. But it was due to Azahel's stubbornness. He even told Azahel, according to the scripture, I said, okay, chase any of these soldiers. At least the people you can fight and kill. I don't mind. Azahel said, no, it's you I want to kill. So it, it was Azahel's naughtiness, stubbornness, that led to his destruction. But yet his brothers, Joab and Abishai, they, they, they did not know that. They, they are, their mentality was how to take revenge. And now they have gotten what they wanted. Okay, verse 31. And David said to Joab and to all the people that were with him, rend your clothes and give you with sackcloth and mourn before, before Abner. And the king himself followed the bear. Can you see that? So King David now said, hey, hey you, Joab, Gather with those people that followed you, all of you, tear your clothes now and begin to cry. Begin to cry for him. So he commanded them to mourn Abner by force. And what did David do? David also joined them in mourning. David was a leader that leads by example. So if David comes and says, let's fast. If David comes and says, everybody fast, you will not see him eating rice and chicken. He will also join the fast. Leading by example. That's the best way to lead. Lead by example. Verse 32, and they buried Abner in Hebron. And the king lifted up his voice and wept at the grave of Abner. And all the people wept. It pained David. David cried. He cried. He cried. Because he knew that Abner was being sincere. This, I just feel like saying Joab now. I, will have, I don't know what I will have done to him. Joab is very unreasonable. He, he was blinded by this revenge. He wanted to revenge. Please don't allow revenge to, to overtake you. Because if you do, you will do a lot, of, a lot of terrible things you should not do. Verse 33. And the king lamented over Abner and said, Died Abner as a fool diet? Thy hands were not born, nor thy feet put into fetters, as a man falleth before wicked, before wicked men. So for less thou. And all the people wept again over him. And all the people came to and all the people came to cause David to eat meat. While it was yet day. David swore, saying, So do God to me, and more so if I taste bread or aught else till the sun be down. So the people came to David after the burial ceremony and said, Please eat. David said, Me? So do God to me. If I eat, if David placed a curse on himself. He said, if I will never taste anything till evening. They begged him to eat. He said, no, I will not eat. Because he wanted to mourn for Abner. For all the people and all Israel understood that day that it was not of the king to slay Abner, the son of Nea. Can you see that? So because of this reaction of David, 
then the people now knew that okay david was not behind the death either there's a way you act and that action will justify you because if david had not mourned for abner he will never become king over the entire israel because the remaining 11 tribes will never submit to him they will see him as a traitor Habna came to work for you, to tell us, to allow you, to let you rule us. Now you are killing him. What a wicked man. They will never allow him to rule. But because he mourned, because of his reaction, it, it became clear to people that, okay, David did not have a hand in his death. How you react goes a long way. It can either justify you or condemn you. Your actions can either justify you or condemn you. Verse 38. And the king said to his servants, Know ye not that there is a prince and a great man falling this day in Israel? Can you see that? He was referring to Abner, a prince and a great man. Verse 39. And I am this day weak, though anointed, though anointed king. And these men, the sons of Zeruiah, be too hard for me. The Lord shall reward the doer of evil according to his wickedness. Can you see that? So, <laughs> David had to confess at this point. David said, This day now I am weak. Though I'm an anointed king, but I'm weak. And he said, This man, the sons of Zeruiah, Zeruiah, they are too hard for me. But I know the Lord will reward them for their wickedness. Now, who are the men David is referring to? Who are the sons of Zeruiah that David was referring to? He was referring to Joab, Abishai, and Azahel. These three were born by Zeruiah. So they were part of David's family. Are you getting what I'm saying? Now, David was not their biological father, but they were part of the family that came to David while he was in Adullam. So they were like cousins. Are you getting what I'm saying? May the Lord help you to understand his word in the name of Jesus. This is the wisdom of God. Don't sell it.